John 13 through chapter 16 represent the last lessons that Christ taught for his disciples. And in 13, notice verses 1 and 2. Chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. This is the Lord's Supper. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, <coughs> having loved his own, that's the disciples, and us, we are his own, which he died for, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Now, supper, verse 2. And supper, that is the Lord's last supper, the Lord's supper. So it's not communion. It's communion, yes. It's not communion? Well, <coughs> it's the observance of the Passover. But as we transfer it over into the New Testament, it becomes communion. Mm -hmm. But at this time, <coughs> it's not communion. There wasn't any such thing. Yeah. But what he did on this occasion became the example of Our what we call communion. Oh yes, on the later part. On the later part. Yeah. <coughs> and supper being ended, watch every word carefully. Watch it. And supper being ended. Okay, they ate. And then they had what we would call communion. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Wow. Satan has no access to our hearts or anybody's heart except by invitation. In other words, Satan cannot decide to come into your heart and you're suddenly <coughs> demon-possessed and you didn't ever want to be. It's not true. Satan comes in by invitation. Mm -hmm. Same with the Lord. And the devil is the counterfeit of the Lord. You don't wake up one day and, hey, I'm saved. I don't know what happened, but I'm saved. I'm born to heaven. Jesus in my heart. No. All of that happened with a conscious decision on your part. And it's the same with devil possession, demon possession. You don't wake up one day and, hey, what happened last night? I'm, I'm, I'm filled with the devil. I want to do evil things and I can't help it. It's Calvinism fits devil worship the same as it does uh, salvation in the Lord. It is your choice. You have a free will. And the Bible says resist the devil and he'll flee from you. It's when you break down that resistance and you are intrigued by or interested in what the devil can do for you. I didn't read it all, but just yesterday I was reading a news article about a rock and roller that made really famous and he wrote music for rock and roll and he played and he entertained many, many people. And he said, which I believed 50 years ago, he said, I remember the time when I invited Satan in. And he started working in my life. And he used those words. It was on the news. Fox News uh, 
general, um, what do you call it, headlines. And he said, I remember the time when I invited the devil in. Now, let me say this. The devil will bless you. It's not like the blessings of God, but he will make you famous. Come on, fight like a man. <laughs> oh, he will make you famous. He will make you rich. He will give you power. Uh, sir, how, how, what can you say about the a gambler, a cock fighter, fighting gambler, when he said, uh, when he prayed, that uh, he can win that cup fight. I believe it. I believe so it. the devil is the one who will answer his prayer. At the yes. moment he will win. Yes, that's true. Makadao, munta akong manok sa bulang. That's true. The devil can make your record sell if you're um, a uh, music artist. The devil can make your book famous he'll make you famous he'll give you power he'll give you whatever you want but it's all connected with this world it's all connected with your damnation it's all connected with the worldly uh, properties money and power and stuff like that so there are even expressions which they say I will sell my soul to the devil. That's exactly what he did. And he used that term. And so did Satan. And so can you. Now, mm -hmm. you're, you, you've got the Lord in you and you're preserved. So, But you can still give your life to the devil. You can't give your soul to the devil. You can give it before you're saved. And I don't know about if you can ever get out of that with your soul, but you have a life, and you've chosen to give it to serve Jesus Christ. You can do the same thing with your life after you get saved and give your life to the devil, but he can't uh, own or possess you your can, soul. You can give or you, uh, the, the term is you can allow the devil to use you. Yes, that's correct. Well, I don't know if allow or give in that sense. It's one thing to give, because at the moment you give, no more left from, for, from, for you. But if you will just allow, there are things which you can also... That's true, but let's go back to a Christian. When a Christian... is already saved. Yes, he's already saved. Yeah. Does he give his life to the Lord, or does he allow the Lord to use his life? Mm -hmm. He gave his life, at the same time he allows. Well, the same with the devil. He gives his life and allows the devil to use his life. So how about no man can pluck them out of my hand? But you haven't lost your salvation. But you've lost your testimony. And the devil is allowed, because of your choice, the devil is allowed to use your life as a testimony for wickedness. That's in First Corinthians, isn't it? Oh, see that one, just five, seven, seven, Corinthians. No, First Corinthians. First Corinthians, what? You shall new creature. Deliver your body to Satan and your Yes, save so as my life. Well, that's a different yes, subject that altogether. That's Paul that delivered the man that was wicked mm -hmm. sleeping with his mother-in-law, mm -hmm. delivered him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh mm -hmm. that his spirit might be saved. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the man's decision. It was Paul's decision. Mm -hmm. Go. Okay. So back to Judas. Judas made a conscious decision to be used by the devil. Mm -hmm. Now look look in verse
Well, I know it's here. I just preached it. So the verses which says, uh, "Those who are born of God sin it not." Those who are born of God sin it not. Well, that's your soul, and that's it. It's, it's referring to the soul, right? Yes. Nothing can change once you have made your decision to receive Christ. You're locked into Christ. Seal. Seal yeah. into Christ. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about now. Yeah. You still have a life in the flesh. And it's your choice to give that life to God or to the world or to the devil. So who, 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 who dictates and who controls that? Our mind? You or the devil mm. or you allow the world to um, to influence you. Any one of those three. So, the word, the flesh and the demon. I can't understand that. Yeah, okay, go. I've got the wrong reference. It's my fault. Go to Luke chapter 22. So, sir, Luke. excuse me, sir. Uh, I will just uh, one time. I'm, I'm just uh, quite a little bit uh, disturbed with this uh, total depravity of men because I, what's in my mind uh, is that uh, there is there's a saying that there is always best. In the worst of us, and there is always worse in the best of us. What can you say about that kind of saying? There is always best in the worst of us, and there is always worse in the best of us. Because if we believe in the total depravity of man, then there's no best in in, in us, all worse. So. That uh, that will uh, enhance the total depravity of man because the there is something good in every ma in every bad person. There is always good in him. There's none good, no. Not because one. the Bible says there is none good. And also it says uh, the best thing you can do. All of our righteousnesses. Yeah, it's a Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's none. There, I don't agree with that statement so, at all. Therefore, if, if none is righteous and no one is righteous, then that proves that there is uh, man is totally, yeah, but totally total, helpless. Total depravity in a Calvinist. Is the, has it really has a real, really a different meaning? They say total depravity means you're so bad you cannot choose to do good. You cannot choose to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior because you're totally depraved. You have nothing in you that can make the decision to choose Jesus as your Savior. So it always uh, erase our free will. That's what they mean. That's the purpose of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. You don't have the capability 
to decide, to decide. A right decision uh -huh. when it comes to salvation. You're totally depraved. So, God had to make that decision for some, which is the unconditional election. And when he made the decision for some, let's say, uh, you know, 12 million, I'm just guessing a number. God made that decision, and before the foundation of the world, he chose those 12 million. And when he died on the cross, he only shed blood, limited atonement, for the, to pay for the sins of the 12 million. And it says no more chance. No, no more chance, no more blood. Because God wouldn't waste his blood. And those 12 million that did not have the power to choose Jesus. And God had to elect them. And God paid for their sins with his blood on the cross, but no more. Then when God saved them, they didn't have any choice. Irresistible grace. They had to be saved. They had no will of their own. Irresistible grace. And those 12 million will live for God. They have no they have no decision, no choice there. They will live for God. And that's the last point. Perseverance. So, so the truth about when Adam wa, wa, made the first uh, sin, committed the first sin, so right there and then, they have that capacity to know good between good and evil, right? Yeah. Because at the moment, the, the at the moment you eat the fruit, you will know what is good and evil. Yeah. What about before they, before they eat the fruit? They have no idea what they're, is good and what is evil? They're innocent. They're like... They're like uh, because they are perfect during that time. So they have no... The knowing between good and evil is not in their vocabulary. That's what, is that what we mean? It's like a three-month-old child. They don't know what's right. What's right and what's what, wrong. What Actually, the choice is good and evil, not right and wrong. But they don't know that something is evil or something, something is good. Right. So, so there no is, idea, no idea. Yeah, that's yeah. right. They're in a period of innocence. Okay. And that was what Adam had before the tree. Okay, so they're like a child. Yes. Not knowing what they do. Exactly correct. So if they do not know what they do, what kind of perfect creation are, are, they, are they? God gave them a commandment, one commandment, don't eat the tree. They disobeyed that commandment and they found out that it was evil. But it was their choice. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're not, I don't care. I mean, we'll study Calvinism if you want. I'm prepared, ready, guns loaded. Yeah, yeah. All okay. of that. Yeah, yeah. But we're studying yes, yes. the life of Let's Christ. Let's go on. Luke chapter 22. <laughs> I had the wrong reference here. Look in, uh, it's still the same time as John 13, and they're going to observe the Lord's Supper in this chapter. But I wanted you to see, look in verse 2. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, and they feared, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. All right. Satan enters Judas at this time. But I told you, Satan has no way to get inside you except by invitation. So, look in verse 4. This is interesting. And he went his way and communed. Look at that word, communed. Where's that verse, sir? In verse 4. 20, Luke 22.4. Luke 22.4. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. Now, look, 
right now, all of us are having communion. Not the observance of the Lord's Supper. I'm not talking about that. But we're all in the same place. We're talking about the same thing. And we're having fellowship one with another. We're all saved. We all have the Holy Spirit. And we're talking about the things of the Bible. So we are communing. That's a special word. To commune means to have intimate talk with. And we're doing that. Now in the same chapter, in chapter 22, the disciples communed, and it uses that word, communed with the Lord. So here's Judas Iscariot that meets with the chief priests and captains who want to destroy Jesus. And they're looking for somebody just to identify Jesus at night in the garden when it's a little hard. They don't want to get the wrong man. So they talk with Judas Iscariot, and Judas Iscariot, here's the point, Judas Iscariot in the same chapter had communion with those that wanted to kill Jesus Christ, and in the same chapter had communion with Jesus Christ. Luke 22? Yeah. And that's how close it can be. In other words, in other words, somebody can be in church at the altar with their Bible open and be filled with the devil. You can't tell by the outward appearance. And none of the disciples knew that it was Judas Iscariot that was going to betray him. When Jesus, with all the twelve there, when Jesus said, somebody at this table is going to betray me. Maybe they're not paying attention when Jesus gave that bread to Judas. He gave it to Judas. And yeah. Judas took it. And yeah. Judas ate it. So they didn't pay attention when Jesus said that. When Jesus did that. But they're asking, right? Yeah. <laughs> They said, who is this? And he says, he that dippeth with his sop in with me. And Judas was the first one to dip. But then others dipped as well. They had a bowl in the middle. And you took your bread and you dipped it in the juice. You would call it what, buy-in? Would you call it buy-in in your language? Yeah. All right, everybody is dipping the bread in the buy-in. Judas did it too. Jesus said, whoever dips it in here is going to betray me. And Judas was probably the first one. I don't know about that. But the other men did it as well. So how can you tell by who dips it? They all dipped it. So Judas, here's the point. At the same time, the same hour, Judas is having communion with those that want to kill Christ, and he's having communion with Christ. So that's why I just had communion Wednesday night. In fact, it was, it was, uh, I'll show you. Look at this, this is a video. <laughs> I made the communion bread, the wafers that you take for communion. In class, they're all sitting here. I made the communion bread right there. It's the only Bible Institute in probably in the world that teaches you how to make your own communion bread. Yeah. Interesting. Yes, ma'am. Anyway, uh, do we do we do we need to follow it literally when Christ break the bread? Because we do we do not break it, and we we do not I mean, we do not drink on the same cup. We we distribute different cups. It's true. 
That's all true. Today. I don't think that makes much difference. It's all broken for us. And the cups, no matter what you drink out of. I know that there are those that teach common cup communion and that it has to be done that way. They also teach washing of feet and it has to be done the way it is. But sometimes it's uh, uh, unhealthy. Unhealthy to drink in the same cup. Well, it's not very sanitary. Yeah, unsanitary. Especially if, if, if you, you are go. in the number 20, it's good if you were the, if you are the first one to use the cup. Yeah. yeah, how about the guy that, that does it? <laughs> There's not a man here that wants to drink after that. Yes. Yeah. He's unsure. Depressed, the 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 you just eat the bread and I, I drink the wine. That's the Catholic way of doing it. <laughs> of course, if there's enough alcohol in the wine, it probably would kill all the germs from the seeds in the car. <laughs> okay. So that's why, in communion, if it's done right, According to 1 Corinthians 14, not 14, 11, 11. 11. If it's done right, the pastor will give an opportunity to the people individually to examine yourself and to get these the un, unconfessed sins or bad attitude or unclean spirit out of you so that when you take communion, you're actually communing with the Lord. Judas, I don't know what he did. 1 Corinthians 11 wasn't written at that time. And the Lord Jesus Christ didn't command the, the disciples to confess their sins. But he did say... If you take this cup unworthily, and if you check that out, it's you've got sin in your life, and you're not worthy to take the communion cup, but you won't confess it to get right. That's what that unworthily so, it says. And it says, if you do that, you're liable to get sick, and you could die, depending on your heart. So first, you have to examine yourself before uh, partaking. That's what you're supposed to do. If At the moment, you have seen if you have seen something wrong or sin, automatically confess it, then partake. Not like Judas when he said when he know that he get out and hang himself. So because. Uh, let everyone examine himself. Okay, we are here now. So before we partake, let's examine ourselves. After knowing that we have seen, automatically we will acknowledge our decision and confess it. That's what's supposed to happen. Yeah, then that's the time we can already partake. That's correct. Because there are some who will not partake. They will just get out. Because uh, I cannot, I, I, I feel bad, so. Next time, I will participate next time. I dealt with that. Not, not this time. And I say, I told them, people get scared when they see that if you do that unworthily, you can get sick and you can even die. Oh, well, then I don't want to do it. God's not honored by that. And that means that you love your sin more than you love God. Yes. Because God says right. to do it. Yeah. But don't do it with sin in your life. Confess it. Well, I don't want to get rid of my sin, so I just won't do it. No, you're not. No, no, no you're wrong. So, mm -hmm. Judas is an example of someone who took the Lord's Supper with sin. He had a plan to go and, and uh, reveal Christ, deny Christ, or whatever. Uh, betray Christ. He had a plan to do that. He took communion. Well, what happened to Judas? He went out and hanged himself. 
So it can be suicidal. Even though you don't think you could commit suicide, you get full of the devil. And that's what the devil wants, is for you to die for his glory and not live a life for the glory of God. That's what happens to a lot of people that are demon-possessed and won't get pregnant. So that's why, sir, uh, before we partake the Lord's Supper, we sing the song, Search Me, O God. We should. And we should not just sing the song. Cause and after that. It's easy yeah. to sing a lie. Mm. Yeah. I'll go where he wants me to go, dear Lord. Well, how about Africa right now? But not oh, in no, Talatan. No, no. But not in Talatan. What? But not in Talatan. But not, in in, but there. not next door. <laughs> or not to my grandma, who's a devout Catholic. <laughs> wow. There's a lot involved. In yeah, that. okay. So it's not literal. It's not literal. It's symbolical when you do it. Well, it has to do with your heart. Yeah. Everything in the Christian life, life has to do with your heart. And yeah, your what I mean, it's not literal. Blood and well, not, not like other things, uh, Catholic are doing it. Well, we do not practice it substantiation. Well, Catholics don't have literal blood and body either. They just are hypocrites. And they say a magic thing, you know, that, that's, that's changed from flour and water to the flesh of Jesus Christ. And it's, of course, it's not. But, but there's, they, a, there's a report from a priest in a gadgets that in Poland there's a miracle happen in Poland that the flesh or uh, that the bread really turns to real flesh. You believe that? No, I don't believe I'm real blood. I don't believe because that is the man-made. If you're, if you're a Catholic, you're supposed to believe that. And if you don't, they kill you. They've done that in the dark ages. They killed many Christians that said, I don't believe in transubstantiation. And they said, you die. And they said, then I die. But I don't believe that that's the body and blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It happened many times. I've got stories. I've got testimonials of people that were killed by the Catholics during the Inquisition when they said, no, I don't believe that. Martin Luther should have been killed. Somehow he got out. But he didn't believe in transubstantiation. Okay, Judas Iscariot. We've, we've studied him before. But here, yeah. in the same chapter, he communes with those that don't believe and he communes with those that believe. You know what that tells me is that someone during communion that fails to examine themselves can sit there and take the Lord's Supper and be full of the devil. Mm -hmm. Now, here, Baptist writers, they believe in closed Communion. Does your pastor practice that? Only the members of the church are allowed to take communion. Yeah. Yeah. Most, most fundamental Baptists, uh, most Bapt uh, Bible Baptists are doing that, close communion. But fundamental Baptists are open, open communion. Whether you are a member of another local church, as long as you are saved, you have, you are eternally yeah. secured, you can partake. Okay, let's see how much you know then. Bible Bath Church. Closed communion. Yeah. Why? Well, uh, because uh, according to them, uh, you have your own nest there. It's like a bird. Then you partake to the, your own local church. Not... Yeah, no. 
but the Bible says wherever you go of the same faith, you, part, you participate. I understand the opposite. Yeah. But why the Bible Baptist? I don't know. Limited. It's because the pastor feels like it's his responsibility to keep the church free from uncleanness, so free how, from compromise. How can he be sure that all those who participate? That's the foolishness of it. But he says no outsiders. In other words, if you became a member of our church by baptism, and I, you know, you agreed with the things of this church, and there's no outsiders, then we have a pure church. Mm -hmm. And it's the pastor's responsibility to keep the church pure. You know what I say to that? <laughs> <laughs> That's hypocrisy. That's exactly correct. <laughs> You are you like cannot. you are like a Jew. Can you imagine a pastor's responsibility to decide who is holy, is, is qualified to take communion? And if you're not qualified, according to me, the pastor, then you can't take communion. It's idiocy. Yeah. But that's Baptist pride doctrine. Baptist pride doctrine. Pride doctrine, yeah. And the answer to that is that Jesus Christ knew who Judas Iscariot was. He knew who would defile, who would betray him. He knew Jesus was present and he served communion to Judas and Judas took it. What do you do about that? If anybody could judge who was disqualified for taking communion, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. And he gave it to Judas Iscariot. Amen. And if that made the church there impure, then Jesus did it. Yeah, right. They, they don't want to talk. Baptist bride, I mean, yeah, they don't want to talk that far into it. Because Judas was a member of the church there. He was one of the twelve. And Jesus, if anybody was the pastor, he was the pastor. And yet he served communion to Judas Iscariot, being full of the devil. So that is this that is the reason of those pastors. Exactly right. Why they have a close communion? That's the whole reason for closed communion. Because they are the one responsible. That's to correct. keep the church pure. That's correct. Are they God that they can say the mind, they can read the mind and the heart of the member, all the members? That's also the reason why when you come to join their church from another church, they require you to be re baptized. Re -baptized. Wow. So that they can be assured that their church is pure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's crazy. Absolutely insane. I will open and think you now, look in Luke chapter 22, Luke 22, 22, 26, what? 22, 26, about no. the cup, break the one cup, no, uh, You've already said you wouldn't do it. I wouldn't 26, do it. 26, 
Well, I'm teaching too many different places from the Bible. <laughs> I'm getting old. Okay, verse 19. <laughs> Verse 17, Jesus Christ at the Last Supper. He said, uh, take, and he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine, no wine, no alcohol, <laughs> until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread, gave thanks, break it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supping, uh, supper, saying, This cup, the New Testament, in my, my blood. blood, which is shed for you. So Judas Iscariot took communion at the hand of Jesus Christ moments before he went and betrayed Jesus Christ. He also had already made plans for that in that it says he communed with, in verse 4, he communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. Then, after that, he went in and communed with Christ and the disciples, and Christ took a pitcher of water and poured it in a bowl and girded himself and washed the feet of Judas Iscariot and served him communion. Incredible. But the whole point is that Judas Iscariot made his own decision in his heart to receive Satan into his heart to go and commune with those that would kill Christ and make a deal with them and then leave that company <clears throat> and go with the disciples and to let Jesus wash his feet and to take communion being full of the devil in Redel. So sir, at that time there is no eternal security yet? No. Okay. No. And Jesus and Judas, when he died, when he hanged himself, the Bible says. He didn't go to heaven. He didn't go to hell. The Bible says he went to his own place. Interesting. The reason is he's going to come back. He's got more duties to perform as Antichrist. He's going to be reincarnated in the body of Antichrist. Interesting. You see, you've got to believe that you've got to believe that man has free will. Because everything in all of the Bible is messed up if you take away one ounce of that free will. Now, nothing else in nature has a free will. The stars have to shine. The clouds have to rain or not rain. No choice. <laughs> the animals have to obey. Yeah, no the choice. trees have to grow or they have to die. Nothing else that God created has free will except man. Mm.
Jesus said of Judas, one of you is a devil. The devil incarnate in the flesh. And, Ju and Jesus knew who it was. Nobody else knew who it was. That ought to really put fear into you because you go to church, we all go to church. Which one's a devil? Which one's a child of God? Which one will betray the church? Look, I had 11 close years with this man down the hill. I knew there were problems, but there's problems with everybody. I did not realize what he was capable of doing and what he actually did. Because his sin, his offense is against the church, and the church is the bride of Christ. He's in trouble. He's in deep trouble. He's still offending the Lord. He is, uh, I guess he is insisting, insisting in proving himself that what uh, what he does is right. My wife. So the more he gets into trouble. Yeah. My wife went up three nights ago to watch them play basketball. Our group, we watched them play basketball. Our men on the property. She's sitting there. And James drove home. And he got out of the vehicle and he walked past my wife. And he said, Good afternoon, Miss Robin. What? And then he walked on. Smug is the English word for it. Presumptuous. And when he, when he went to the Burundi captain's office and I was there, that's the last time I saw him. He comes walking over publicly and he says, Good afternoon, the others. I'm, I'm, if I'm exaggerating, I stand before God. And it's hard to take. What do you do? What do you do? You say, Bukhana? The man that's stealing your land? Do you shake his hand? Do you say, good afternoon, Dr. King? <laughs> that, that, somebody funny. You hug him for me, okay? <laughs> I will say, good afternoon. <laughs> That's what I felt like doing, too. Uh, you know, sir, uh, I, we met a friend in... Now, look in uh, look in First Corinthians eleven. First Corinthians eleven. So you see, there's no way, no. Uh, how shall I say it, perfect way, secure way to keep your church from being defiled. Even Jesus couldn't or wouldn't do it. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 22. What, have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say unto you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take ye, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. 
After the same manner, he took the cup which he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye, as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Now picture, picture in your mind Judas Iscariot at the Last Supper. Verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. In other words, you're not worthy. Why are you not worthy? Because you have sin. Unconfessed sin. An attitude of sin. A heart of sin. If you have that, you're not worthy to partake of the blood, body and blood of the Lord. Verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So you're examining yourself to see if you're worthy. What makes you worthy? All sins confessed. You're right with the Lord. Your attitude is great. You love God. You're doing what He tells you to do. You have no complaints against God. You have no murmuring. You have no gossip. You're right with the Lord. That's what makes you worthy. Verse 29, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body. Now at this time, we have eternal security. By the time it's 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So, damnation cannot be spiritual damnation. In other words, if you take of the Lord's Supper unworthily, there's no chance you're going to go to hell. Damnation is the physical damnation. And to prove that, he says in verse 30, the very next verse, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. That's physical damnation to your body. It has no effect upon your soul. Judas Iscariot, what happened to him after he took communion unworthily. He went out and hanged himself. Exactly what happened. Verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Okay, that's, that goes along with 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, if I judge myself, here's the communion, here's the cup, here's the bread. It's time to take communion. But if I examine myself and I say, you know what? I've been doing that sin a long time and it's deep inside me, but I confess it. God, take that sin away from me. Cleanse me. And if you want instruction on that, it's in Psalm 51, David uh, repented, and that is the ideal format on how to repent and how to confess your sin. He said, man, I've got sin all through me because I was conceived in sin. In other words, I was a sinner when I was inside my mother's womb. And it's my nature to sin. That's what David said. And that's what you should tell the Lord. The Lord already knows it, but He wants to hear it from your mouth. You remember in the garden, God called to Adam. He said, Adam, where art thou? It, it was not that the Lord did not know which tree He was hiding <coughs> behind. It was that He wanted to hear it from Adam's mouth. I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? 
because I'm naked. Why are you naked? Have you eaten the tree that I told you not to? And Adam has to say yes. But he doesn't say yes. He blames it on his wife. So the Lord gives the wife the chance. She doesn't confess either. She blames it on the serpent. Now, during communion, when it's time to examine yourself, here's the way you do it. You don't say, now, I told that lie because brother so-and-so did this, didn't I? Well, you're blaming it on him. I committed this fornication because she dresses so provocative. I couldn't help my, you know, that's not it. It's me. It's me. The old Negro spiritual. Me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of sin. It's not my father, not my mother, but it's me, O oh Lord. It's not my aunt, it's not my uncle, it's not my best friend, it's not my pastor. It's me, O oh Lord, yes. standing in the need of prayer. I said sin. So, let's finish this out. In chapter 11, verse 32 to 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So what you're doing, when you examine yourselves, you look in the mirror, the mirror of the Word of God, and you say, man, I lie. I've got a bad attitude. I am full of the devil. I'm doing what the devil tells me to do. I'm doing what the world tells me to do. I'm doing what my flesh tells me what to do. I am wicked as hell. When you do that, then you say, God, I confess my sin. He forgives you of your sin. You're clean. You're now worthy to commune with the Lord through the supper. Now, I used the illustration the other day and when I had communion. I said, you know, if I, the, I had a birthday at um, February 12th last month. And I had a birthday party. And I invited people that I wanted at my birthday party. I didn't invite my enemy. <laughs> Either would you. I didn't invite the people that have done me wrong. I didn't invite, you know, my ex-wife. <laughs> you wouldn't do that. If you had an ex-wife, you wouldn't invite her. You commune with the people that you love to commune with. And that is a qualification right there. Jesus Christ invites you to come and commune with him. That means, as far as Jesus is concerned, you're qualified to commune with him. But Judas Iscariot judged himself worthy to commune with the Lord. At the same time, he was communing with the enemies of the Lord. It's crazy. How about the and sin will the drive you crazy. Sir, how about the communion in us? Graduating in the school, you really still did in the school. The Catholic offered for the students to take the communion. What kind of communion is that? They are worthy <laughs> or not? <laughs> Verse 32. Jesus, excuse me. Verse 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Okay, if you can judge yourself by way of 1 John 1, 9, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin, then you're separated from those of the world that will be judged by the Lord at the great white throne. Revelation 20 and verse 15. You're separate from the world. And he says, but when you're judged, you're chastened of the Lord, that you should not be condemned with the world. So I don't stand 
at the great white throne judgment. That's for the world. My judgment was taken by Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. And I'm separated from that judgment. Verse 33. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one with another. In other words, this is communion. This is a celebration. This is a supper. Enjoy the fellowship of the saints. Amen. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. The rest will I settle, uh, will I set in order when I come. So communion is not to satisfy your hunger or your gluttony. Communion is to come together with the saints, with Jesus Christ, and remember what he did for you and that he's coming. Amen. Question. And it was the Lord. It's a spiritual communion, right? It's more on spiritual communion. Of course. Yeah. By the word of God. You can't commune with Jesus in the flesh. Yes. Any questions? This is outside of our topic. Uh, the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Okay. The kingdom of heaven is literal. There, there are thrones. There are Jesus Christ. You can see him on That's the on throne. the millennium. What? Millennium. Millennium is when you can see Jesus Christ. But... The kingdom of God is a spirit. But even a physical kingdom has a spiritual part to it. In other words, when I flew into the Philippines 30 years ago, I landed in Davao. Okay, I can see the airport. We went downtown. I could see the buildings and I could see the people in their homes and all. That's the physical aspect of it. But there's also a spiritual aspect. I knew I was in the Philippines. I could tell people looking at me, I'm making this up of course, but it's true. People look at me, they know I'm a foreigner. I know they're foreigners. I'm a guest in their country. Look how they treat me. Look at their customs. Look at this. All of that is the spiritual aspect of the physical kingdom. Same with the United States. If you flew into New York, Detroit, Chicago, San Francisco, L.A., there would be a spiritual aspect to that physical kingdom. And that's true with the Lord. In other words, in the millennium, when you can see Jesus Christ sitting on the throne and you could go up and touch the throne, there's also an atmosphere. There's also a spiritual part of it. So, in millennium, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are together. That doesn't mean they're the same. They're not the same. But when one exists, the other exists. Right now, they're separated. The kingdom of heaven, everything physical about God is in heaven. Uh, there is no, on earth, there is no physical aspect of God. You can't see him. He's not here. He doesn't have a throne. And that was the reason why when Jesus was before Pilate, Pilate looked at him and he says, are you a king? And Jesus said, I was born to be a king. And he, you know, uh, Pilate kind of looked around and he said, yeah, you're a king. Where's your throne? Where's your crown? Huh? You weren't the crown of thorns. Mm -hmm. So there was no physical aspect to the kingdom of heaven, even though in Jesus Christ he is the king. 
and he's the king of the kingdom of heaven, he's the king of the kingdom of God. But when he died, he went to heaven. Now we're separated. We only have the kingdom of God. But when one day he's coming, John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeah. So that's the millennium he's talking about. Yeah, it was supposed to be. But it changed because the Jews said, we don't want you as king. So if ever the Jews accepted Christ during the time, so how could he be crucified? If ever, that didn't happen. That's a, if, if they had accepted him as king, how could he be crucified? That's a very okay. difficult question to answer. Now, it could have happened, but we don't know what might have happened if what had happened hadn't happened. That's very difficult. In other words, if you hadn't come here today, what would have happened to you? You can only guess. You you may have... Uh, After things happen. You, I mean, you just can't play that game satisfactorily. Uh. You could say, well, I could have slept in. Yeah, you might have. You might have died choking on a piece of meat. Uh, you could, that's a billion things that could have happened. But you chose to come today, so here you are. Thank you, sir. Another question, sir. When was really the church started? When the was church? the church started? I can almost tell who you've been studying under. The church came into existence and started functioning in Acts chapter 2. In the Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. The Pentecost. But, if you say that the church happened in, in Acts chapter 2, then where does that leave the thief on the cross? Is the thief on the cross part of the church? Because he died after Jesus Christ died. So that started the New Testament when Jesus died on the cross. And the thief on the cross died after Jesus Christ. So that puts him into the bride. No, 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 no. But it, the church is not visible and functioning until Acts chapter. Because in, in Matthew, I am just confused. I asked this also. Matthew 18, 17? Yeah. I think during this time, there is still no church as we are now. Jesus Christ said, and if he shall neglect to hear them, this is about the, the argument. The argument. Yeah. Tell it unto the church, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an hidden man and a publican. Okay, the word church, that's an argument that is debatable. The word church simply means a called out assembly. Yeah. Ecclesia. Out this is not equivalent to us now, this time, or only a group of people. Yeah. You could say the Mason. Or a church. I don't mean they're religious. I don't mean they're saved. But they are a called out assembly. The yeah. Eagle Club. Eagles Club. The Sisters of the Virgin Mary. <laughs> they call them church. They're a church. But the right term church is we are the right term. Or the, the real church. The body of Christ. Yeah. Right of Christ. Now, it also talks about the church in the wilderness. Or he is speaking it for future. Yes. Possible. Okay. Prophetic. The church in the wilderness was the Jews when they came out of Israel. But that doesn't mean they're a church like we're a church. They were a called out assembly. But that's the, not the New Testament church. Thank you. The New Testament church began with the death of Jesus Christ. 
when the New Testament began. But it was not visible or functional until Acts 2. Kind of a tricky question. Point of debate. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.